Welcome, 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 everybody. It's Wednesday, 3 p.m., so this is Drawing Together. My name's Scott Meyer with Artist Network, and every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, we get together to draw together. Today, we're working on a master copy of a Rubens drawing. So this is a fun one. I posted a link in the description on how I created the toned paper for this this project here. So if you haven't looked at that, it might be worth it to kind of look through that briefly just so you understand how where I'm kind of starting from here because it may give you completely different results if you don't have the same type of paper. Having said that, there's still so much you can learn going through this exercise with whatever material you have. So this is part of the Art of the Steel series in which you know, we take a master artist, we find a drawing by them, and we try to create a master copy. And the goal in the master copy isn't to make an exact duplicate of the original work. It's to try to put ourselves in the mind of the artist, follow in their footsteps, footsteps by decoding the information we can glean from the marks that we're observing. There's a lot of information that we can gather, you know, about the pace, the direction, whether it's, it's a, an exploratory mark or whether it's very slow and controlled and kind of a detailed mark. There's a lot that we can really decode there. So that's what I'm gonna be walking through today. So, all right, let's take a look at the project here. So this is my preparatory drawing and I feel like it had some, some degree of success. I learned quite a bit about Rubens here. The, um, you can see that there's just a, there's a quality, there's a delicacy to Rubens' work that I really haven't captured in this first one that I'm gonna try to improve on in this next one. And I say that so that you can kind of put this into context. You know, this is part of the exercise. This is part of the grind that we go through as artists to continually improve. Um, I wanna shout out to everybody who's saying hello. Uh, it's good to see you all. I hope everything is kind of synchronized today. We've had some issues with the whole setup here um, and things are kind of kind of scrambled at the last moment, but hopefully everything is synchronized uh, well enough and that you can see everything clearly. Um, if not, let me know and I can try to make some quick adjustments. So you can see I, I've made some changes to the set and I'm just continually trying to prove, improve things and I often mess things up instead of improve them. Okay, but we're here to draw. If you wanna follow along and you wanna find the same reference image, you can find that in the description below. This is taken from Wikimedia Commons. I believe this is a Google Art Project image. Um, I also have the list of materials and you can find the link to the show page on artistnetwork.com where you can share your work when you're done. So I'd love to see the examples um, again, this is all about the work that we put in as artists to improve. It's not about perfection, it's about perfect practice. So let's get to that. Here we have the toned paper. Um, and this is, again, what I created in the, uh, the, the, there's a link in the description below that will take you to this video on how I created this. This is a cotton rag paper. I believe it's the Reeves BFK. I dampened it. I coated it with a watercolor mixture, kind of messed with it, kind of experimented with it a few times in order to create this surface. And what I was going for is a quality of, of tone that in some way mimics the tone of the lion, which appears to be the base tone of the paper for, uh, for his uh, image. Now, there's also you know, some additional tone on top of there. So if I go through the rest of the materials, I'm really just gonna keep it simple. I've got a 2B pencil. Um, I have white and black. These are the Soho sketch squares. So it's basically a compressed charcoal. Uh, I have a tinted or kind of a toned charcoal here, this yellow ochre charcoal from uh, the Derwent XL. And then I have my uh, needed eraser as well. That's all I'm going to be working with today. And I, and I kind of feel like that, ba just based on the information I'm seeing in the original, that the the, the tools were fairly simple then. So, um, okay. So, i got to bring myself into focus here, try to get into Ruben's mindset. Um, there, in the, in the initial attempt, I took the approach of starting with the starting with the graphite and I'm going to use the overhand grip to just orient myself a little bit. Now there 
there really isn't much that I see in the work that suggests to me that Rubens started with these loose exploratory marks, these gestural marks. Um, but I do need some sort of, um, I need some way to orient myself a little. Um, and so I'm going to just kind of warm up with a gesture with these light overhand marks, allowing the pencil to scrape across the surface and try to think through just largely where the line is going to be. Where, you know, what are the, the main elements here? This is just like, you know, any other kind of gesture. It's about getting information on the page. And from this information that we have on the page, we can make specific decisions about how things need to change rather than try to hit it right out of the gate. Um, and then by hopefully giving other, ourselves a certain amount of orientation, we will be able to kind of lock into the specific marks that Rubens is making. So I'm just allowing my eyes to relax as I look at the reference image. I'm reacting to the form. I can see them adjacent to one another. And, and I'm making some, some, some quick assessments. There's a question about the size in the paper. Thank you for asking that question. I, cut, I measured this down. The paper is a little bit larger than what I need. But I then measured the exact dimensions that were displayed in, in the, the image that I found online. And I believe that's 9 and 15 sixteenths tall. That's 9 and 15 sixteenths, so almost 10 inches tall by 11 and 1 eighth wide, if I remember correctly. Um, and so it's very precisely measured to the exact size, at least that I assume that this was drawn at. If I, if I can trust the, the information online, that's, the, uh, that's what I'm going for. So, um, all right. Now that, that quick gesture is pretty, pretty loose. I am going to start to navigate through this. Now, typically when I draw, I have a, I have the small thumbnail. I see what you're seeing on the screen. So a very small thumbnail next to my large drawing. Um, I can move this out of the way. Um, and I have the large one up here to my left. And that's really what I'm going to be drawing from more as the large one. Now, I usually draw from the smaller thumbnail more throughout the drawing, but I'm going to just try to spend a little bit more time um, really trying to study the marks. So, I'll be sticking with the graphite for this first stage because I do feel like that is what's accounting for a majority of the, that base layer. Uh, and part of what I'm seeing is if you look under the chin area, we see where some of that dark chalk is coming in. And it's, it's getting kind of blotchy. And that can sometimes happen when you're trying to put chalk or charcoal on top of the smoother, slicker graphite. Um, and so that's one indication. And then just looking at the way some of the marks are layered, it feels like that's underneath. And I say that just because you may have a different um, kind of understanding about that. Maybe you may have a different conclusion. And that is, that's perfectly fine. That's really what this is about. This is about you trying to identify your relationship to the drawing, doing your best you know, with all the, the preconceptions and, and your own personality, you know, your own way of interpreting information, you're doing your best to put yourself in the mind of, of Rubens, but that's going to be different than what I do. So um, I hope, hopefully that makes sense. And again, it's really about kind of understanding your association to it. Um, and I... I think what I want to do is block in some of the shadow side of the, the image. And you can see that he's um, using this fairly dynamic diagonal mark through a lot of the drawing. That's an indication to me that he's right-handed or he is quite proficient with, um, with ambidextrous marks. 
And this is going to help me um, also just kind of place the lion properly. Okay, so one of the things that I'll be doing frequently through throughout the drawing is doing a check-in with where I am relative to other aspects of the drawing. So taking a plumb line, running it vertically through the drawing so I can see where am I relative to other aspects vertically, either above or below that point of reference, or using a horizontal guide running laterally. So um, I'll be doing that quite a bit. Um, and I'm going to do my best to kind of point that out when I can. It's all very dark down in here. Okay. And I can let that kind of smooth out a little bit. Um, these, are, these are kind of initial marks, and they may have to take multiple passes over quite a few areas of it. Um, now, what I think I'm going to do actually now is take some time to kind of find some orientation points. So I'm looking at this lock of hair here. It's kind of to the right, on the right side of the head. It kind of drops down and then we pick up the back below here. And that looks like it's largely, you know, in the center, it's just past center of the paper. So I want to get that in. I can indicate over here where there's this part I can look for the general axis here, and I can place the central axis of the lion's head roughly in between, a little bit more to the left of center between those two initial marks that I established, that kind of a part in the main. And a rough indication of where the, the mouth might go. In the eyes. So giving myself some just more points of reference that I'll have to adjust as I go along. Now I'm using this overhand grip uh, because it, it, it really accomplishes many things. Uh, one of them being that it's a kind of a gentler mark and uh, it, it's going to be more easy to erase and adjust if I need to. Looking at the relationship between, see if I have the chin kind of down here. Uh, looking at the relationship between the chin and the feet. And instead of erasing, I'm just going to allow tone to build up and kind of soften edges. Um, it helps to add kind of the, to the age of the work, and then I can take another stab at it. Um, the, uh, oh, the other thing, if you are new, I want to welcome you. Um, again, we do this every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. This is episode 145, so there are 144 additional episodes that you can go back and watch spanning the last two years. Uh, so feel free to jump in wherever you would prefer to. Um, there, if you do have any questions, comments, observations, that's what the chat's for. And so I'm going to do my best to monitor that as I go. So feel free to throw out any questions you have. For example, Peter is asking, what paper do I like the most? Um, I do like a cotton rag paper to draw on the most. Um, and that varies. Sometimes I prefer the, the Reeves BFK. Sometimes it's a Somerset. Uh, you know, Legion makes some really wonderful papers that I enjoy to work on. Um, but there are really some awesome alternative papers. So Hanamula makes a really wonderful bamboo paper, for example. Um, so you really play around with the different ones that you like. But I, like I said, I kind of lean towards the cotton rag papers. Um, and I've been actually painting. Actually, that painting right behind me, that's on a rag paper. That's Legion's um, Stonehenge oil. So it's actually prepared to paint directly on with oil. Um, so that is... That's kind of where my head's at. 
Um, now let me see. The chin should be approximately midway. So um, that will help me to orient some of the other elements. Now, one of the things you can see over here is that there's a kind of a ghostly line that Rubens had left. It looks like from an earlier attempt to place that front leg. Um, and what's, what's interesting is that it aligns pretty closely with the, the same attempt that I made right in here to try to really, really place that, that mark. Okay. So now that I've got some additional marks here, I'm going to come across. I'm going to try start to indicate this back leg. What? I forgot to put my <laughs> phone on airplane mode. So hopefully. There we go. See a little bit of the studio there. Spam. You can never, never avoid it, huh? So I may get more because it's going to take me a little while to get that off of, <laughs> get that off of spam or off of. Oh, I need to put it on airplane mode. Is what I need to do. Um, I'm going to square that up a little bit better. Hello, everybody. If you're new, I'd love to hear where you're viewing from. All right, now. So we really haven't gotten into the, any point yet where I can start to really mimic his marks. But my hope is that we'll we'll get there soon. I need to make the head just bigger. I'm just gonna race out a little bit of this. I do like this toned paper. Uh, um, again, if you haven't watched the video um, or if you're joining late, I posted a link to the video in the description where I kind of walk through the process I use to tone the paper. Is anybody working on like a hand-toned paper? Uh, anything that you would have created yourself? If so, I'd love to hear how it went. It's a really fun experience, especially, um, you know, if you're looking to kind of push the creativity a bit and break out of um, any kind of habits that you've been locked into. Um, changing things up with the surface can really uh, unlock some interesting creative ideas. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna soften this and kind of come back to working with the head later. So now I kind of need to jump into trying to mimic his marks. Again, there's not a lot of exploratory marks in here that I can see. And what I, what I mean by that, you can, you can sometimes tell in the nature of a mark whether it was created with confidence or if there's a certain amount of, um, of a tentative quality to it. Um, you can tell if, you're, if they're making multiple attempts to try to find an edge. That's really an exploratory mark. I don't see a lot of that here. There's a degree of confidence to these marks that's a little intimidating. Um, but my goal is going to try to be to match the, the overall confidence of those marks and, um, you know, where I see a mark created in one fell swoop, I'm going to try to create it in one fell swoop, even if my swoop looks different than Ruben's swoop, if that makes sense. Um, let's see, there's another ear over here.
Um, I do want to, I want to make sure I'm placing the eyes properly. Uh, because I'm finding that it's, it's kind of throwing me off a little bit. So what I observe, if the chin is essentially midway up the paper, the from chin to eye is approximately midway from between the eyes and the top of the head or where it cuts off the paper. So I can take this, cut it in half, and this is the axis where the eyes should be. And there's a bit of a slant there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna indicate that, kind of erase out these older marks. Um, and then if I take that and divide it even farther, the nose almost perfectly divides the distance between the eyes and the chin. So again, this is midway on the paper. The eyes are midway between the chin and the top of the paper. And then the nose is midway between the eyes and the chin. And I'm gonna intentionally kind of smooth out my marks like this because I, that helps me to get rid of my visual language and adopt his a bit more. Uh, Jackie's saying I toned watercolor paper with iced tea. Nice. Um, it's got a lot of texture to it. That's really cool. Um, yeah, Edie is asking what the original medium is. Um, it was indicated online that it was graphite um, and I believe black and white chalk um, or charcoal. Um, they're very, very similar in kind of, in the way he's using it here, I think you could probably work with those two, chalk or charcoal, pretty interchangeably. Um, but I, I, you know, you will have kind of a subtle difference between them. Again, I kind of settled on my Soho sketch squares, which are more kind of charcoal, um, and it gave me a, a pretty, um, pretty close result. Um, but it would be good to compare the two. Where I do see a difference is the white does feel more like a chalk than like a white charcoal. Um, but I think again, for the the purposes of really understanding his mindset, um, I think you can kind of work with either of them. And that's why I feel like even if you don't have toned paper, you can still learn a lot um, even by using different media. Okay, let me kind of wipe this down a little bit. Now, where do I want to go? Where do I want to go? I'm going to start kind of from left to right. And one of the things that I observe in, his, in the quality of his lines is a lot of variability. Um, I'm trying to see if, if these are overhand, like tripod grip marks. Um, you know, if they're overhand, if they're a tripod, I can't quite tell. And I'm going to use this overhand. And you can see like here at the top of the head, it's a finer mark. Um, and because each of the lines has that variability that I was just talking about, it kind of gives me an indication that he's using kind of an overhand grip like this. Because if you you know, if you, if you consider the orientation of the point like this, if you scrape it up, it's gonna be a broad mark. If you drag it this way, it's gonna be a very fine mark. And you can rotate your hands and, and play with that as well. Now, the, the one of the things that I'm gonna be looking for is Again, the confidence in the mark. 
Um, and so, you know, you saw these marks here. I hit it in one swoop, and it looks like that's how Rubens would have done it as well. And so if you are trying to capture that same quality, but you're a bit nervous, take a few attempts um, just kind of practicing the marks without, without committing to them on the page. And so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm actually relying on my fingernails quite a bit. I can place them on the page, oops, place them on the page, and that gives me some support, and then I can roll over in this overhand grip to, to give me a little bit more kind of precision. As I roll my hand, it engages the tip more for a finer mark. And as I lay it flat, it becomes kind of a more broad mark. And so take some practice, take some time. And if you need to have even a scrap paper that you can practice the marks on first, go right ahead. Um, the other thing that I'm trying to look at is what can I glean in the in the original about the um, where the mark starts or the or, or origination or the origination of the mark? Does it start low and come up high? Does it start high and come down low? Um, and and again, we may have we may come to different conclusions about that. It's really difficult to tell. So, kind of experiment with that as well. We've got a lot of opportunities to create Rubens-like marks. And if you like this this mark here, I hit way too hard. So I can kind of tap that out and try it again. Um, and my instinct is to really tackle the mark again rather than try to massage the mark and get it to work, if that makes sense. You know, I get a sense that, you know, with you know, with so much practice and skill, um, you know, he's got a lot of confidence in these marks. All right, but uh, one of the things that I'm really observing is that, that flow and pressure as well. So we start up light, and this is a good example. We start light, come down, press harder, and then kind of lift off. There's a graceful quality to it. Um, here on the forehead, we see a, a swath of directional hatching there. And I do wonder, you know, I'm not sh confident that he would have used a pencil like this. He may have just used a stick of graphite. Um, so actually, I'm going to kind of work my way around some of these marks here. So some of this gets cropped off. And we just see how kind of efficient and confident he is. I'm going to say that over and over again. There's a confidence to it. So we see a, like this one curl at the top. It's very light. He comes down, presses hard, and around in a swoop. And then he kind of comes in at almost at a, at a kind of a triangular a triangulation of that. He comes in a little bit below, but comes back to meet that curl to create that lock of hair. And uh, one thing I notice is that I, you know, I definitely don't have. The, the graceful kind of confidence that he's got. Um, and what I mean by that is when you when we look at these curves, 
especially some in the curl, some of the S curves, um, you know, mine just get, they, they lose that graceful quality in some of them. So that's something I'm practicing. Um, so it can be really helpful to kind of practice those S curves. Uh, I think one of the things that I found is that I get kind of locked into a set of motions. So if we look up here, we see a beautiful S curve and create this lock here. And not only that, but it looks like he's tackled it in two marks. He's got like one coming up here, and then he completes the rest of the curve this way. So it's not one solid scoop, but maybe he's broken it into two parts. Um, and so one of the advantages to this assignment is that it helps you to kind of break out of certain habits not necessarily bad habits, but just your habits and see what you can learn by adopting someone else's. And then and Rubens was really a master of of the cross contour and, cont and contour hatching. You know, he, for Rubens, it's the volumetric uh, sentiment, I think, of his marks that really stands out both in his paintings and his drawings. Um, um, so at this point, I'm still working with the graphite. Um, I'll come in with the charcoal. That'll really be at the end. So a majority of this drawing will be done with the graphite as I try to discover the form and discover the marks. And then the charcoal will come back later to enhance those marks. Um, so there'll be more kind of processing of information with the graphite. So this is an interesting spot here. Um, right under here, I don't know if you can look in closely at your copy, but we see these diagonal marks that cast a shadow underneath this lock of fur. Um, now, if we look at, if we look at this edge of that shadow, it looks like it's been cut into with an eraser. Uh, and so that's one of the things that I'm also gonna look at is, are there any indications that he might have used an eraser to kind of extract some of those highlights? Like right in here, I feel like he might have lifted some. And then right here along the forehead, it, it looks like he's kind of sculpting with the eraser a little bit as well. And the, what I'm looking for is, again, we see the, these marks here that seem like they're kind of cut, it's like you cut off the bird ends. Like so if, you, if we go like this, you, your, your mark's gonna be heavier on the inside um, and that looks like it's been cut off by an eraser here. So it's very small, but sometimes those small details can say a lot about how the artists work. All right, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay on this side of the figure. I see these, these parallel hatch marks here down that run down in towards the center of the the nose there's need to lift off some of this some of the marks there um, and then we also see some marks that run down the length of that central crease
Now, the other thing that is really profound here, and we're going to point out a few examples, is his ability to control compound curves. And that may be kind of a confusing term if you're kind of new, but really what a compound curve is, it's the joining of multiple curves to create an edge. That's ultimately what expresses a sense of form and volume when you're using contour lines. Um, you know, just, just a quick note, I'm going to get back to those, the, the compound curves, but as I'm coming down in here, you see this really nice kind of delicate line here, and you come down, and then there's a kind of a finer array of hatch marks in there. And so I'm really observing that variety of mark. He's using really the full range of his mark-making toolkit here. So some really fine lines and some really thick, broad, softer edges. Uh, Mariana, I use the fingernail of the little finger on the drawing hand to pivot the pencil, like an old-school compass. Yes, um, but movement comes from the shoulder. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm glad you, you put that out there. Um, you know, I tend to try to lock my wrist as much as possible and draw from the shoulder, but um, there are times when the natural pivot to the wrist is really helpful. So I'm, thank you for sharing that. If anybody else has uh, anything about you know, their, your own process, let me I'd love to hear it. Uh, now, looking at this eye, it's impacted by quite a bit. It's not a perfect circle. Um, and then it's, it's being impacted by both the black and white chalk. You know, the black chalk being put in there to increase the intensity around the eye, and then the white adding contrast and kind of cutting in on top of it. Uh, so I'm just kind of making a mental note. He's really laying on the, the pencil here, and he's thinking not only about that edge, but also a shadow. He's creating this form as a... It's a kind of a contour edge for the brow into that shadow. And then let's look at, to get back to that compound curve, you know, we look at the structure of the eye and we see that as a series of marks that all accumulate together. And he's really, you know, he's really enhancing that shadow. I think I, I think I overstated some of this, but some of this will be kind of picked up more with the charcoal. But like here is a good example of a compound curve. The overall shape of this is a U, but as we move in towards the center of that shape, it changes direction slightly, and then it creates this. A kind of alternative curve. I'm going to try to take another stab at this. I think I was just too heavy handed. And then this is, uh, I, think I, can, I think I want to adjust this as well. Now we look under here and we can see he's really paying attention to that transition. So he's aware that the snout is a form that moves back in space. There's an element of foreshortening that's impacting the overall shape that we're observing. Um, and so as a result, he's observing the changes that take place as we go back in space from the snout being, in the, the nostrils kind of being in front, moving back along that edge. Um, and now, as we look at this area, we can also see that there's a distinct light side and shadow side. So light side and shadow side. And I'm working on the shadow side now, and the marks change direction 
from here where we're going up the triangular slope of the nostril, as we move here, we're going up the vertical slope of that kind of cheekbone. And then you have some really distinct hatch marks there to add intensity. All right, welcome Leslie. I'm glad you could make it. Sounds like you're into something really fun. Uh, he's got this kind of faint line under there. All right, now as we move back and forth, let's see. I want to create this shape. And now it looks like he's created the back end of the mouth in a few attempts. You can see multiple passes, and he comes into it with the, char the chalk later, the charcoal. Now, this is another really great example of the complex or compound curve. As you move along this, the center of the mouth, Uh, I want you to be really paying attention to which portion of the mouth is in advancing and what's receding, what's overlapping what. So let's kind of break this curve down here. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little bit more information, then I'll kind of describe more what I'm, what I'm talking about so once we see it in total. And as you look in some of these dark areas, you can see evidence of some of the earlier kind of uh, the passes with the graphite. And there's a strong diagonal pull here. I'm going to ignore this for now. Actually, I'm going to lift off a little bit. I think I, I think I see an eraser mark here. I see an eraser mark here as well. And right in here. Okay. So we've, we've, I've got a little bit more information now to, to kind of talk about. But if we look at this shape, you can see how it's constantly changing. It's not a line. There, there's this kind of asymmetrical form here. It's wide where the, the front of the, that top lip is in front of the lower lip, and then all of a sudden that, that pad on the lower lip comes in in front of the upper lip, and then it cuts back into space, and now this portion here is on top of that lower lip. So if you're, if you're looking at the curve, try to be thinking about that the subtle shifts between concave and convex. So where you see a concave form pushing into another form, that's going to appear to be on top. Um, where it's convex, it's going to feel like it's pushed underneath. Uh, so here's a really good example. This upper lip appears to be on top of the lower lip because it's concave relative to that lower lip. It's pushing into that space. And then it flips. Now all of a sudden, this lower lip is convex, pushing into the concave form of that, that upper lip if that makes sense. So hopefully that's making sense. If not, please let me know. Uh, but it is something that we observe a lot in Ruben's work. This is something that we picked up in um, Degas' work as well. That ability to really understand those subtle relationships and then using that those contour edges to um, to describe, uh, you know, the, the structure of an arm or the, the structure of a leg. Um, now, I'm not thinking about any sort of anatomical understanding or expression of, 
of this form. I'm just really trying to focus on the individual marks. I should say though that uh, there's a lot of very there are a lot of very quick decisions being made um, before I make these marks. I'm doing a quick check-in to see where I am relative to the rest of the form. Now, as we move here, we see these kind of hatch marks that follow along the cross contour of that front snout. So he's not drawing individual whiskers, but he is paying attention to these dark spots where the whiskers emerge. Um, and you can see that they follow these, these circular paths that follow along the cross contour of the lion's snout. Deanne is saying, yeah, it's a, it is quite an emotional drawing. And once you get into it, there's, there's such an expression in the eyes and in the mouth, in the gesture. It's a really profound form. All right, so in this head, he's also doing something that we see in other parts of the drawing, where we understand the path of this lower lip to be this kind of S curve like this little bit, it's kind of a sharp curve here, kind of angles out and then comes up, right? So we understand that path, but rather than really drawing that path, he's, he's holding onto it in his mind and he's paying attention to the direction of the fur that seems to obscure that edge. And so by, by doing that, he's giving these visual cues that suggests that the that there is again it's that fur that obscures that that edge. I'm gonna erase this out and retake some of these lines. Alright, so now as so we follow along this edge and again, we understand the lion's ed a leg to be here, but we can't see all of it all the time. You see a really distinct mark here. Now, we can, we can identify the rough shape and identify that rough shape as this, this form here. But to get back to his expression of the compound curves, Let's analyze that leg a little bit. We can see how even though it, it accumulates together to create a curve that moves in this direction, it's broken into parts of curves that move in the opposite direction. And I'm, I'm hoping that makes sense. Um, you know, I can, on an, on an example here, I can pull this out. Um, you know, imagine a curve like this, but instead of piecing it together with pieces that all move in the same direction, you have these individual elements that move in kind of the opposing direction that accumulate together to create this curve, right? You know, so some of these sections are going to be straight. Some of them are actually going to align with that curve. Some are going to run contrary to it. So being able to hold those two things in your mind, the, the totality of that shape and the individual segments, that's where you start to arrive at some really specific um, and graceful marks. Um, and here he's really obscuring the back side of that front leg because then he comes in on top with, um, with this front leg being a sharper, clearer line. Does everybody kind of get that, what I was saying about the Understanding the totality here, we can see the angle of that front leg, but then understanding how each of those segments may run in a contrary direction. So I'm seeing these, uh, kind of an initial layer of these hatch marks 
is parallel hatching to identify that shadow. Um, but actually, before I do that, yeah, you can see how there's this lock that really has a nice wave to it, but he's breaking it down into sections. He's not creating one long S-curve. That's really helpful because I would not really be able to do that <laughs> in one long curve. But if he did, I would have to because that's how we learn to be um, kind of mindful of these master artists' marks. Um, up here in the hair, we start to get more delicate marks. I think I've kind of muddied up the page a little bit too much. Oh, Janie, yeah, I mean, I'm curious of what you're <laughs> um, uh, what you're saying there. Um, uh, sorry if I missed. Oh yeah, Leslie, um, you have some questions about the paper. I do have a link in the description below the video um, that'll take you to a short video that shows how I toned the paper. So this is this was toned by with watercolors, um, and and I you know tried to match that quality of of gray that I see in the work, and it does make me want to tone more paper to get more precise. Uh, you get more of a precise surface. It's a lot of fun. Um, and I just used this cotton rag paper, so I used the Rives BFK, or the Reeves BFK. As I'm, it's really easy to get lost in these curls. All right. Now, he tends to slow down and really pay attention to areas like this, where it's kind of getting darker, and here where it's kind of getting darker as well, to create the overall form of the lock of fur. Not, he's not getting bogged down in any one strand of fur or hair. He's um, he's just trying to capture the overall essence. All right, as we move into this section, there are a few really graceful marks. He's not messing around. Like, he's not tiptoeing. I'm kind of tiptoeing. But I'm tiptoeing because I'm, I want to be able to hit that mark with a certain degree of confidence like he did. So as we look at these curls... You can see there, it's like he's gently landing, he's leaning into it and around the curve, and then he's kind of banking it up and around. So there's, there's a, a car, kind of a carving quality, a sculptural quality to this. So let's see, I want that curl to be just slightly above the eyes there. And so what I see is he's kind of making this initial kind of S curve, and then it looks like he's coming, he's starting at the end and kind of wrapping back around. And again, I'm trying to pay attention to where the mark is, is, has a higher degree of pressure. Where is he going heavy? Where is he going light? And then right in line with the eyes is that line along the back that, um, that originates from behind the fur. Now this edge is really a beautiful line. Um, it's probably my favorite mark in the whole drawing. Now, I think that's, I understand how nerdy that sounds to have a favorite mark in a drawing. But 
I think many of you would agree that sometimes you hit, you just see a mark and you're like, that's beautiful. I want to describe why. So this line describes so much as we are, as we come away from the, f the fur there, and I kind of keep missing it, so I'm going to keep erasing it and to keep trying to strike it. Um, as we come out from the hair where he's indicating the, the back of the lion, right? So that's the, the outer contour. And we go from a slight kind of concave into convex. It kind of starts to level out. And now what we're doing is like all of a sudden that mark is now representing kind of just past the rib cage, right? It's, it's, not, it's gone from a contour line representing the edge of the three-dimensional object into the cross contour line. These are the lines that, that are kind of inside the outer edge that help to illuminate the volume. Um, and that's just a beautiful mark. And now what we see is, as we follow along that contour, another line comes in and it changes direction to capture the kind of that sway in the back. Then another line now all of a sudden changes direction. And it comes down and again it goes from representing the edge of the line to now kind of that backside. And it's just, it's a, the, the whole sequence is just beautiful. But right in here, that's just like, again, my kind of favorite mark of the drawing. And I have that same kind of response sometimes with, um, with Sargent's work. I'm like, that one mark says so much. Okay. Yeah, yeah, some good observations here. Um, oh, yeah, okay, Jane, you said you drew the snow hair earlier. Nice, that's a great, that's a great subject. Um, now, looking at this, I've kind of squished this a bit. So I'm going to take another stab at it. and see if that works better. I feel like that does. Um, and again, rather than really kind of simply adjusting the line, I, I prefer to take it out and then try it again so that it has that quality of the, the premier coup, the first strike. Ooh, I don't know if I like that. Now, I need to kind of erase some of those marks. And try to indicate that back leg there. Um, I'm going to look at this back leg. Though that and that graceful quality of the mark comes in again. And again, now we see these overlapping of forms. We see this, this dark mark that represents that back hindquarter, this vertical line that comes in and it takes over. Now that becomes the contour. And now we, we change direction. We've got another mark that comes in and takes over as the contour mark. So it's like I, I kind of view it as kind of handing off from one mark to another as you move along a contour edge. Um, I, that's kind of... It's, it's kind of a messy mark, so I'm going to try that again. And again, finding that line and then handing off from one mark to the next. Everything's kind of shifted over, so I'm running out of space here. And I don't want to, I don't want to compress the, the tail just to fit it in, so I'll let it run a little wide.
Um, uh, thank you, Ursula. Welcome, everybody. I hope everybody's having a good, uh, having some warm weather. Here in Colorado, it's been an interesting one. Finally getting warm today, but we definitely need the rain, so. All right. Um, I'm going to kind of dance around this area a little bit to make sure that I'm placing that front leg properly. Um, so here, again, I'm really trying to pay attention to the direction of the marks as he's looking to indicate that the underside of the belly, and we can see that you know he's changing the quality of his marks um, to represent the change in the fur. So if uh, one of the things that I've been saying with greater frequency lately is that I'm trying to think the idea that all drawing is gesture drawing. All right, and so what do I mean by that? Well, a gesture is a mark that, that it's, it's a reactionary mark that represents your kind of initial understanding of the, of the, the form that you're observing. You're reacting to the form. And in essence, you're trying to say as much with a gesture mark as you can, you know, with as few, with as little information, with as little, a few kind of actual marks, you're trying to describe mu as much about the subject as you can. And, and so often we, you know, we think of a gesture as kind of a, you know, a few graceful lines that are represent the whole figure. And that's, that's true. But if we hold that mentality throughout the entire drawing, and we think that each mark is a gesture, it just goes from describing something big into something small, then what that does for me at least is it, it helps me to stay focused on the idea that each mark counts and that each mark can convey more information than, than you might be putting into it, if that makes sense. So um, if you look here, this is really what, what I, I think stands out. These few marks along here, along this edge, help to convey a, a range of complex observations about the changing quality of the fur going from this, these long hairs over the, the main part of the coat into something that is kind of shorter and more delicate. And so each mark, again, it, it conveys something that, you know, that in, in, a, in a degree of efficiency that is really beautiful. So each mark really counts. And it's like, it's like as though he's trying to say, can I make each one of these marks give back more than I'm putting into it? Um, if I look here, you know, he, you could see this really kind of zigzag mark really quick. And part of what makes that work is it's relying on the natural observations of the viewer. The idea that each of our brains um, is trying to solve problems and trying to understand what we're look what it's looking at. Um, and um, and is, and is used to, to actually interpreting things with minimal information. You know, and that's because in our world around us, there's far more information available to us than we're consciously able to uh, interpret. And so it has to get good at just taking, trying to determine what are the, what are the minimal things in the environment that I need to understand in order to navigate this world. All right, the whole hindquarter area is darker than the front. So I'm going to come in darker. Now I'm going to try to observe 
the directional quality of his marks as much as possible. Um, what you could see here, it's going to come back in with the, with the, char the chalk later, um, but you can see how he's breaking down that back leg into various segments. As he's observing the changing planes, he's changing the direction of his mark. So going at this really steep angle here, as he comes up around the form, it's changing direction slightly. We come around again along kind of the flat side of the that flank there, and he's seeing that it gets darker as it represents some of the muscles, and he's actually flicking this way. And then we have the contour edge describing more about that back leg as well. All right, so. I need to, I need to address this. The, the size of this leg again, I need to widen it out a bit. And you're seeing this shadow core here, where it gets darker on the interior of that form. Now the tail passes between the legs. And I see a kind of the dark form here of the leg. And then he kind of he tries to indicate it with a little bit with a line, but he's he's really diffusing that back leg to help push that back. So there's greater clarity on the edge in that foreground leg. So he's really he's really interested in form here. You know, a lot of these marks are are intentionally describing the cross contour of the of the forms. Oh yeah, I like your observation, um, Stephanie, about our perspective relative to the lion. We're really low, <laughs> and makes this feel makes this lion feel so massive. Um, okay, so now we're at a really an interesting part. So again, talking about his um, observations about especially contour edges, we know that there that this represents the, the edge of that leg. But I think based on his observations, that edge is largely obscured by these longer furs, you know, hairs that kind of come off that backside. And so he's observing that path, but rather than drawing that path, he's, he's indicating it with these shorter marks that represent the direction of the fur and the quality of the fur from longer to shorter, right? Um, and then there's a slight indication of that back part of that front leg. Look how big these paws are. Uh, now, and we see uh, up here again a similar observation about that shadow core really deepening this section of that leg. And he's I'm gonna darken it and then he's got this layer of cross contour marks that help to reveal that form along that front leg. And it changes direction here to help indicate the muscles in that area. And then I wanna darken this as well. All right, so now we're, we're at a very similar spot as we were right here, where he's got this mane. So and he, this is a, a really, again, a, th there's a lot going on here that I know that I wasn't really aware of when I first saw this drawing. So going through this process helps me to become aware 
of some of the subtle things that have a, have a degree of depth to them that is pretty profound. So if we look at the shape of this mane, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually draw the path of the mane here. I think he actually he indicated it. I see a faint line under here. All right, so it wraps up like this. This line here helps to define, again, the contour of that front leg. And that mane is wrapping down behind, so that front leg um, pushing into this area. It's convex. This is concave, and so this appears to be on top. Now, that, f that, that mane tucks in behind that leg. All of a sudden, this path is convex, pushing into this leg, which is concave. Now, this feels like it's on top of that, right? And so that he's observing that really beautiful path, but he's not giving himself much to indicate that path. He's seeing that, again, it's broken up by this, these furs. He's changing direction. And, and so he's, he's indicated that edge, you know, in a, in, in a really complex way. And my guess is that it's just largely intuitive after years of sketching and painting and studying forms. There's a few kind of graceful marks here. I haven't haven't drawn this part yet, so I need to get in on that. Just kind of knock things down a little bit with my palm. You can see it's really building up some nice, some graphite there. Um, some really fine lines in the hair area, the hairia. And then I love how this mane kind of emerges out of that shadow that tucks in behind the cheek there. Um, now finally, I just have, I have some of these kind of finer uh, marks here to put in there to help indicate that form as we're moving back around. So we're going back in space, but there's also a sense of volume here. You know, this is a, a, a nearly spherical form here and that's been kind of elongated, kind of an oval shape. And so here we can see that he's paying attention really to two dimensions. So he's got these marks here that follow the cross contour, creating that sense of volume there. But then he's also using these hatch marks to, to suggest that depth leading away. So much information being carried by these lines is really awesome. And there are these kind of darker spots here that create a bit more form. Now, the other thing that I'm observing is that, you know, if we, if we go back to this edge, my favorite mark, it's lighter in value than these marks here, especially right in here, it gets nice and dark. Um, and that's helpful for creating that sense of form and volume. It brings that center out more and it softens that contour edge. Now, let me go back in and refine this front leg a little bit more. Uh, 
All right. It is such a macho lion. Uh, Linda, so uh, I started a picture with a lion. I would love to share it with you so you can... Um, uh, yeah, so I'd be happy to take a look at your work. If you want to share it on the show page for this episode, a lot of, many people share works that are similar, um, um, but feel free to also email anybody anybody here. Feel free to email me anytime. So um, let me see. I'm actually going to switch a little bit to this background where he's, he's using a, a little bit of chalk. I'm going to use this toned charcoal to create some separation against the background. This is a bit strong, um, so I'm going to knock it down a little bit with, since my hands are all dirty. And I don't really like what, I, what that the way that looks. So, so it's coming in a bit hot right now. A little strong. I'm going to knock it down a little bit with my pinky. And then I'm going to lift it with the eraser just so I get a, a, a little bit of that tone, but not too much. Soften up some of these marks, lift with a kneaded eraser, kind of again soften it up a little bit. That yellow is a bit too strong, and it's not it's not quite the the same temperature, but it, it does achieve a similar effect of kind of creating some of that separation between the background and the lion. Hmm. Those marks don't want to come off, do they? It's all right. Okay, now I'm going to come back in, just clarify some of the marks that I, I know for our graphite just by looking at them. And then I'm going to have to come back in with the, uh, with the, the dark charcoal. in here, darken it up. I love how up here he's really softening those marks and darkening kind of up in the, the kind of the center of the form here. All right, now, um, Saman is asking, yeah, about the lion itself, this, so when, when was Rubens, what, 1650, somewhere around there? Um, I, I, I'm not remembering my art history very well, so, <laughs> but it's been 20 years since I really studied any of it, so um, my apologies if it's way off, but, um, I believe that's indicated in this the reference image, what year? But um, yeah, there it's. Who knows whether this was created from direct observation or uh, maybe a, perhaps another you know painting or a sculpture or um, yeah, I don't know or written account. I remember hearing stories that when I lived in Alaska of. You know, some of the early pioneers there would send back written descriptions of the elk and moose and polar bears 
to these illustrators, these publishing houses in the, the East Coast, and you have these illustrators trying to interpret the um, trying to interpret these written descriptions and using the visual language that they knew. They, for example, there's lots of deer on the East Coast, and so you'll use that, and so you get. You know, if, these, if you have these illustrators that hadn't seen a moose before, they'll use the closest reference, maybe a deer. So you get a moose that you're like, oh, it kind of looks like a moose, but not like a moose I've ever seen. Or a polar bear that looks more like a dog or something. Um, oh, good. Okay, it wasn't too far off. So 1612, 1613. Um, so I'm just coming in now and with this, this chalk and trying to deepen some of the values. One of the things that's really challenging right now is the way the studio lights are set up, I can't really see what's happening in front of me. Everything is just shining off this paper. <laughs> so I'm really having to rely on the screen that you're seeing to help me with that. Um, So I'm kind of laying it down, softening it a bit, knocking the, the, the tooth of it down a little bit. And just kind of expanding that value range. All right, thank you all if, you've, if anybody has to leave. But if you're new and you're just joining us, what you're watching is Drawing Together with Artist Network. Oh my gosh, I left out this form right in here. Uh, Drawing Together with Artist Network. This is episode 144, 145. So there's 144 previous episodes. We just get together to draw together and challenge ourselves so that we put in the work we need to as artists to grow. So as I'm working this out in my head here. I'm, you know, I've got this stick. It doesn't give me a whole lot of control, but there is an element to it that reminds me of painting, which I, I thoroughly enjoy. So um, the, the, it kind of reminds me somewhat of using a flat brush in the sense that you know, I can roll it on its edge to get a sharp point. I, uh, you know, roll it up onto that corner to get a point. I can lay it down flat on this edge, and that gives me a fine line. I can scrape it across this way, and that gives me a broad stroke. Um, there's so many ways that we can uh, use this to get a variety of marks. Uh, now, let's see. As we work under here, it looks like he might have enhanced some of these marks with that, that chalk or the charcoal. And I'm going to bring out some additional depth in some of these areas. And then you can, you can really see in the line quality in that eye the, the effect of using a stick versus a pencil. You know, there's an irregularity to that eye shape that is really nice. Um, it makes it feel, um, it's very specific. I'm going to make sure that I account for that shadow over the eye. There's that sharp edge there. All right, and as we come in here, we can see that he's layering on, again, depth with that charcoal or the, or the chalk. I have a feeling this is chalk that he's using, not charcoal, but I think, um, so I'm, even though I may not be matching it 
100%, there's, again, a lot that we can learn by using similar uh, materials. Uh, so I'm reworking some of these darker areas here. And this is a great time to make any kind of minor adjustments to the proportions. And, and as I work around the lips, I want to be careful not to be heavy and consistent across the entire form there, but you know, modulate that, that edge a bit more. I'm going to add some depth right in here, especially right up in this area here, adding more depth. But you can see that there's kind of a, there's a, a resistance to this sketch square uh, because of the graphite, and that seems to be consistent with uh, what we're seeing in Rubens' drawing as well. So it's just trying to focus a little bit more, so a little less talking than, but if anybody has any questions, alternative observations. It's that variety along the edges going from light to dark to from thick to thin, that's what really creates form and volume. I feel like this, this dark that I have is a bit more intense than what we're seeing in the, in the original. darken this whole area up. So as I'm doing this, you can see I'm just kind of laying it flat more than anything when I'm building up these broad areas of tone. And then when I need a line, I can just roll it up on the edge and get more, um, more refinement out of that. Right in here, we can kind of reestablish that shadow. I'll push that into the paper a little bit. So I'm losing some of the hatch marks. Uh, so I may have to reestablish them with the, the sketch squares here. Um, you know, and the sketch square has you know four sides, so as I dull one edge, I'm going to just roll it and get to another sharp edge. I got to come back and finish this up. All right. Whew. Ah. 
Um, and someone is asking what the original paper was, and honestly, I don't know. Um, you know, it's possible it was a form of parchment, it's possible it was a rag paper, or... Um, I don't see any of the lines that suggest it was laid paper, but... Um, yeah. So there's a bit more contrast in mine. If, I, if you need to kind of knock yours down a little bit, you can always lift with the needed eraser. Um, and I'm not sure I'm really all that worried about it. Uh, you know, this is a situation if I had used darker paper, um, then that could impact uh, the final result. Uh, so under here, I think this is really going to help to give that form. So really trying to follow along the cross contour of that, that belly to wrap those marks underneath. I got to remind, you know, remember back to some of these lessons we learned about the edges, try to maintain that cross contour information. And I'm just going through to see where I can enhance in some of these other areas. If I build up that tone there, see as I darken that that paper, it helps to uh, helps to darken the lion. Everything's just a little bit too bright, but that's okay. Again, we don't have the same materials he's got, but we are learning a lot about the mark making and the decisions that he would have, or we imagine he would have made. That's the best we can do is imagine, but that's the, that's the power of art, right? We're using our imagination. Um, and again, it's not about creating a, a perfect duplicate. It's about trying to decode the marks and try to recreate the movements that created this work as much as possible. Um, All right, so now if we come back in with the white chalk, we can, we can try to see where he's laying that in. Like along the bridge of the nose, he's observing the light coming in from this side. Uh, so it's catching more, you know, kind of stronger on, on that side, the, that the high points there. Oh, I didn't really get, there's this shadow core in here. Um, right around the eye, he's got this, you know, the, the, the highlights tend to catch on the where the where two planes meet, where they change direction within a, either as a at the the inside or the outside of a turn, it tends to be a bit stronger. Now we see this big blotch here.
You got a little bit down in this area too. All right, and I think that's just about it. You know, I lost some of the fine lines like in this area, so I could try to come back in with the, the graphite and and try to reestablish those. Um, I feel like this is perhaps a bit too much tone applied to the paper, so I could lift off some of that a little bit, clean up that paper. But there you have it. <laughs> so I, I think this turned out all right. You know, about for about an hour and a half, I feel like we learned quite a bit about Rubens and Rubens' process. Um, you know, that's the, the, the whole kind of goal of this exercise is just to, again, to try to decode the marks to some degree and see how it might impact some of the decisions we make, you know, in terms of how do we how do we capture the fur? How do we capture the form? What are the types of information that we look for? Um, and it doesn't doesn't mean that this is how we should draw from now on, but it might influence some of our mark making decisions later on. So as we're you know as our, as you're encountering a similar object, this will kind of ping in your brain and like oh I remember when did the Rubens copy I can I can have that I can hold that in my mind and see if if I apply some of that, the pace and the, the, the sentimentality, the, the sentiment of the work into my own. Uh, but I think, I think I'll call it good for the day. Like I said, I don't, I feel like there's more I could continue to tweak. Um, a lot of this would need to come in, I think, in the in some of the finer details, reclaim some of the some of the marks that were lost. Um, but I feel like we've, in, in general, captured what we're hoping for out of this, and that's a lesson on on Rubens and and how to make form and volume using your hatch marks, paying attention to directional marks, etc. So. Um, I want to thank you all for joining me. Uh, join me again next week. I don't know what we're drawing next week yet. So that's what I'm working on for the rest of the day is trying to figure out what the next subject's going to be. Um, so again, thank you for joining me. I hope to see you next Wednesday again at 3 p.m. Eastern. Everybody have a fantastic week. Share your drawings when you're done. The link uh, for the show page is in the description below or is pinned to the top of the chat here. So have a great week. We'll see you next week. <laughs>